Hey, putting on something like this takes a tremendous amount of work. There's been a team of volunteers been working on this for months and, and really putting it, uh, uh, Natalie and, and the whole crew. Let's make some noise for these folks. They, they <laughs> Okay, so our story today starts uh, with, uh, uh, with understanding how companies invest, and in particular, invest in user experience and things like information architecture and other things like that. And if we want to start there, we should probably ask the question, who has made the most investment? Where has the biggest investment in UX happened? And if we want to isolate that down to a single product or service, uh, we'd be surprised to find out what that was. It turns out it was, in fact, in 2014, the largest we've been able to find, was an investment in something called the Disney Magic Band. The Disney Magic Band was a billion dollar wearable project that Disney embarked on. Billion dollars, right? So, uh, for those of you who've never experienced the Magic Band, you typically buy these things when you book your vacation at one of the theme parks. And when you, a few weeks later, you get this box that's beautifully decorated with your favorite Disney characters. Every member of your family has their own Magic Band that has been customized to them. And uh, these bands are technology rich with three different radio transmitters in them, a GPS, a, a low frequency Bluetooth, and a, a, a um, near field uh, uh, communication system. And you can use them to do things like open your hotel room door, you can get VIP access to amusements and rides, you can walk into any retail space and just pay for things by waving your arm, even on purpose. And uh, my favorite feature, which is that uh, your favorite characters, uh, uh, if you bring a six-year-old to the park and it's their birthday, their favorite character will actually use the GPS on the band to find them in the park and come over and wish them a happy birthday. It's a little creepy, <laughs> but it's cool. Uber has taught us that creepy and cool can coexist. <laughs> Let's get into strangers' cars. Um, the thing that surprised me the most about the Magic Band project isn't just that Disney spent a billion dollars on it but was that Disney pulled this off. And the reason this surprised me was that my first experience thinking about user experience at Disney started back in 1997 when we were investigating the work that was being done at the time by uh, what was called the Disney's Parks and Resorts Division, which is the same group that put together the Magic Band. And that group had just released what they thought was state-of-the-art web design, which was this. <laughs> and so back in 1997, this was the best Disney could do. And the way they approached web design was they basically looked at it as a, uh, you just take uh, an informational site and you put it out there in a way that, that uh, uh, just has a little bit of Tinkerbell on it, and you're done. And that was their thinking. And it was a very, very hard website to use. It's, they rolled out a version of their booking system that allowed you to book vacations. But it really was almost impossible to do. In fact, almost every uh, uh, transaction in the booking system resulted in calling their 800 number to actually finish the transaction with the call center. So the site was very difficult. In fact, it was so difficult that for almost a decade, we used it to train people how to do usability tests. Turns out that when you're training professionals to 
on the techniques of usability testing, having something that's extremely unusable to test makes it much easier. Because <laughs> you get to the unusable things faster. And over time, as we were in, uh, improving the training, we discovered that there were certain tasks that, that we gravitated to because they were so hard to do. One of my favorites was uh, a test task that involved uh, finding a particular hotel. Now, we had gotten to this task because we had been working, exploring what it was like to book vacations at Disney, and we found this mother of a six-year-old who was absolutely in love with trains. And she wanted to stay at a hotel that would allow them to take the monorail every day to go someplace in the park. And she wasn't a person of extensive means, so she was looking for, in essence, the least expensive hotel that's on the monorail at Walt Disney World. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Walt Disney World, there are three resorts on the monorail at Walt Disney World. There's the Grand Floridian, the Contemporary, and the Polynesian. Two of those are excessively expensive. The last one is the Polynesian. So that's the answer to the question. Should be straightforward. Turns out this was not a straightforward task. And we started to keep statistics on it. And what we learned very quickly was that out of every 100 people that we would test with this, only about 10% would actually be able to figure out that the Polynesian Hotel was the hotel they should stay at. But what was even more fascinating was that approximately 20% of the people who we watched do this task accidentally would find themselves on the Disneyland website instead of the Disney World website. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the difference between Disneyland and Disney World, there are many, many differences. The most important probably being that they are 3,000 miles apart. <laughs> and the uh, thing about the Disneyland and Disney World difference is that we weren't sure why these people were landing there. So as one of the things you train people when you train usability testing is you have to train folks to understand why they made it, uh, to try and understand why they made the choices they made. Was it because they didn't know the difference between the parks? Was it because they preferred Disneyland over Disney World? Was it because uh, they knew the difference between the parks, but for some reason they didn't realize they'd somehow clicked over to that part of the information architecture? What was it that caused that uh, issue? And so we would train folks to ask follow-up questions. You can't just come out and say, why did you make that mistake? That's not going to work. So you have to ask in a more subtle, nuanced way. So we would train them to ask questions like, could you ride the monorail from that hotel to Epcot Center? And inevitably, the participants in the study would turn back to the computer, they'd click around the website for a few moments, they'd turn back to the moderator, and they'd say, yes. <laughs> yes, you can. Now, I just want to point out that the monorail is a six-car train that travels at 30 miles per hour and has no restroom. So going the 3,000 miles from Disneyland <laughs> to Disney World is a very long journey. But this was the state of the art in 1997. Years later, I was telling this story at a conference, and uh, this woman comes up to me after the presentation. I look at her badge, and it says, Disney Parks and Resorts. And she says, I want to tell you something. I'm like, okay. She says, you can't tell anyone. I'm like, <laughs> okay. She says, uh, it turns out that that problem with people picking hotels in Disneyland, this happens all the time. So I check with my contacts who work for Disney and sure enough, I learned that, in fact, Disney keeps a block of hotel rooms 
reserved for people who show up at the park with the wrong coast reservations. Right? Because Disney does not want your vacation to be ruined for this. So they actually keep inventory available. Even when the park is otherwise sold out, they will keep a block of rooms open, rooms they could sell for big money, just to accommodate this problem. Think about that for a second, right? In 1997, the state of Disney was that it was cheaper to keep this active inventory unsold than it was to fix the damn website. Right? So if we go back to 1997, this is where we're at. Yet here in 2014, they come out with probably the most aggressive, most interesting user experience effort we've ever seen. How did they get from that website to the magic band? That's the question that I want to answer. And to answer that, we first have to sort of look at, well, how do people learn to do things they don't know how to do? It was clear that Disney did not understand how to do this. And to do that, we have to sort of dip our toes in some theory. And, and one of the theories says that there are basically four stages that any individual goes through when they're learning information architecture or they're learning design or they're learning how to cook or they're learning a language, anything you're learning, there are basically these four stages. The first stage we call unconscious incompetence. And unconscious incompetence is when we don't know how to do something, which makes sense, we're just starting, but we don't know we don't know how to do it. And the first few things we create, we think are fantastic, right? We are, we are happily creating stuff and we, and we we keep doing this, you know, we cook food, we, we make music, whatever it is, we happily go about doing that. And this stage is where many people stay until uh, an inflection point, and usually the inflection point is a friend approaches them and says, please stop, <laughs> you're not that good at this. And it's at that moment when the person realizes something they didn't know, that there's a difference between good and bad. And they hadn't realized that difference. To them, creating anything was good. And suddenly they're sort of stuck at this, at this distinction. And so we get to this moment where we're, we're sort of stuck at this idea of good versus bad quality. And that's when we enter the stage of conscious incompetence. When we get to conscious incompetence, we're now aware that there is this difference, that uh, 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 some things can be good quality, some things can be poor quality, but we have no control over it. We're still incompetent at what we're doing. So we're just producing stuff, and because it's hard to produce good stuff, we tend to produce bad stuff. That's much easier. And so the thing about uh, unconscious incompetence is that it's a very blissful stage. We're just making stuff, we're enjoying it, we're really having a great time. When we get to conscious incompetence, we're now woefully aware of how bad we are at these things, and suddenly we are unhappy about this. We, are, we, we get depressed. Some people persist, and that persistence ends up getting us to start understanding the rituals of producing good design, whether it's uh, playing rudiments and scales and understanding how to, to actually follow sheet music, whether it's following a recipe when we're cooking, whatever it is, we are learning how to do this. And by following those rituals, by doing those things, we end up in the stage of conscious competence. And the thing about conscious competence is we can produce decent results, not great results, but decent results. But those results that we produce uh, uh, are dictated by the recipes or the procedures or the sheet music that we're given. We have to have that in front of us. If we don't have that we can't, and we step off of the path, we fail. So that stage stays for a long time. 
But at some point, we wake up one day and we realize that we don't need the recipe anymore. We don't need the sheet music. We don't need the process or procedure. We can just solve the problem based on our practice and experience. And at that moment, we end up with unconscious competence. And unconscious competence is that point where we're not thinking about the work. We can just produce good results without thinking about every step, every move. Now, what makes this interesting from the aspect of learning information architecture or learning design is that there are actually transitions. It's the transitions that are most interesting. And we can call the transition from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence, we can call that literacy, right? We are learning the difference between good and bad. And by learning this difference, we now can act on it and try and produce better things. But just knowing the difference is key. And we've all worked with team members who can't tell the difference. And because they can't tell the difference, they're blindly choosing bad outcomes. And we're having trouble explaining that to them. So we have to focus on literacy. When we're moving from conscious incompetence to conscious competence, we are now focused on fluency. This is when we start, if we're learning a language, to put together whole sentences and to, to be able to have conversations. And if we talk in terms of cooking, this is being able to put together menus and, and things like that. So now we are, we are becoming more fluent. We understand that there's practices that get us to the things we need to get to. And when we talk about moving from conscious competence to unconscious competence, well, that's what we refer to as mastery. So when we talk about mastering our craft, we are just talking about this last piece here, this idea that we are getting better uh, uh, by working there. But in order to master the craft, we first have to become literate and we have to become fluent. And we often forget that. So now, how does, how does this work with Disney? Well, Disney's an organization. It's not, a, it's not a, a person. So for organizations, the chart looks a little different. And the way the chart looks there is that there are actually five stages. And when we're talking about something like UX design, uh, the first stage we call the dark ages. And the dark ages is when we're unconsciously incompetent and we don't know anything about users. Right? We're not thinking about them at all. We're just thinking about the business. We're thinking about the technology. The fact we can ship an app, that's amazing. It doesn't matter whether the app is usable or not. If, we, if, we, you know, if the users want it, they'll learn it. So it was hard to create, so damn it, it's going to be hard to use. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but what often happens in organizations is Somebody shows up, and it happens now more and more, somebody shows up on the scene who actually understands users. And that new person uh, emerges, and suddenly the team gets to start thinking about, well, how do we make a better experience for users? And at that point, we get to what we call spot UX design. And spot UX design is when a team makes an effort to make something better and often succeeds, but it's only that one effort, and, and they get lost, and the rest of the organization's old practices and habits pressure them back to the old way of doing things, and that small growth doesn't really happen. But then there's an inflection point, and the inflection point happens when someone who has some amount of role power in the organization says, you know, this UX thing, this is actually pretty important to us. We're getting beat in the marketplace, or you know, we're losing our standing, or there's some thing that says, we need to start investing in this. They go out, they hire a design team, they hire a manager for that team, and suddenly they're now putting together this internal design service that is basically to help all the teams be able to actually produce better designs. And for many years, this was what we thought 
the design was, right? That, that we would build these design teams, we would have all the different types of designers on these teams, and we would bring them into projects, and we'd, we'd take advantage of them, we'd use them. But uh, it turns out that there's, there's more to this. We thought that, you know, this would be it. If we, could, if we could just get a big design team and we could have the management of that team get a seat at the table, because apparently there's a table <laughs> that we have to have a seat at. The funny thing about the seat at the table thing is that no matter what department you talk to in an organization, they all wish they had a seat at the table. So I don't actually know who shows up at the table. <laughs> Marketing wants to be there, IT wants to be there, everybody wants to be at the table. Where's the table? It has Herman Miller chairs. I know that much. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, we thought that that would be the end goal, right? If we got a seat at the table and our team was, was represented in all the decisions, we'd be done. But it turns out there's another point, another inflection point. And that inflection point happens when the teams start to demand more. Right? You start working with a team and they love what you're, the designer you've assigned to them is doing and suddenly they're starting to get angry that you keep pulling that designer off and putting them on other projects. They get angry that every so often they have to bring a new designer up to speed because the designer that they had has to go do something else. And they start wanting their own design resources and they s no longer want to share those resources and they want to manage those resources and so they want their own embedded UX designers. And at that point, we get to the embedded UX design stage. And for a long time, we thought this was the ultimate goal. I mean, if we could get a designer on every team, that would be fantastic. But we found that there was another inflection point. And that other inflection point happens when suddenly people who never identified as designers, never had the title, never thought of themselves as a designer, are starting to make smart design decisions. And that process of making smart design decisions, they're doing design work, but they don't think of themselves as designers. So we have all these non-designers designing. We have developers who are actually coming up with a decent first version of whatever it is without any help from a designer. We have product managers who are thinking, uh, I have two choices, I'm gonna pick the one that's better for the users, not necessarily the one that's easiest to ship. And suddenly, we are now in what we call infused UX design. And in infused UX design, design teams are making decisions as a whole, not as, well, the designer decides. It turns out that uh, Disney, when we saw them in 1997, they were definitely in the dark ages. They just needed to ship a website. Users didn't matter. But in 2014, they were definitely at infused UX design. Everybody in the organization, everybody in parks and resorts was making decisions based on what would be best for the user. And that process took them 17 years. So if you're imagining where your organization might be in this progression, uh, and you are less than 17 years into it, you are ahead of Disney. I'm just gonna point that out. Congratulations. Here's the thing. Disney's an organization, and while it's nice to think of the maturity of a whole organization. It's actually not easy to do. In fact, it's almost impossible. In order to figure out what the maturity is, we have to realize that organizations are, in fact, well, made of teams. And in any given organization, we're going to have lots of teams. And those teams are going to be all over the spectrum. Similarly, uh, uh, we're going to have some teams that are well advanced and are 
asking for their own design resources and not putting up with the centralized team anymore. And we have some teams that are still in the dark ages that don't even know that users exist. So we're gonna have to constantly be looking at how do we serve as the design leaders within the organization, we're gonna have to think about, well, how do we serve all of these different teams simultaneously? <laughs> so uh, uh, that's one of the uh, uh, that that is uh, a, a struggle that we have, but it, it's even harder because to figure out where a team is, we have to deal with the fact that teams are actually made of people. Everything eventually comes back to soil and green. <laughs> and in particular, teams from a UX perspective are made of influencers, a particular type of people. These are all the people who influence a project. They may or may not think that they are on a team, but if they are influencing that team's work, they are part of that team. They are affecting that team's decisions. So it's not just the designers who are on the team, it's the developers who are making design decisions, the product managers who are making design decisions, the people in regulation and compliance who are making design decisions. The HR people who are deciding how many designers we get are making a design decision. The budget people, the finance people who are deciding how much money we're gonna invest on a project are making a design decision. All of these people are influencing the project. And we have to look at the maturity of all of those people. And when we look at that, what we see is that while our designer may understand how to serve everybody on the team, we have lots of other people who may not understand what we're trying to do. And it turns out that to figure out where a team is at, we have to look at the individuals. And the individuals that we look at, it turns out we don't average them even though that would be tempting. And we don't look at who the most advanced person is. Like, it's not like if we get somebody who's even more advanced, the team suddenly moves up. Turns out it doesn't. The way a team moves up is by taking the person who is least mature and getting them to be. Because the person who's least mature is the one who's holding the team back. We've all worked on teams where someone didn't get it and it stopped us from doing all the really good things we wanted to do. So as design leaders, our most important job is to get that least mature person to become more mature, to actually move and become fluency. And that turns out to be the path to more maturity is to focus on those least mature people in the organization. Get them to be more literate and then more fluent. So to sort of see this in operation, I want to take you back even further than 1997. I want to take you back to 1953. And in 1953, uh, Honeywell came out with the H model thermostat. And this was a complete change in the way how people thought about home furnishings and design. Because this unit captured the world's imagination as to what something as innocuous as a control for a thermostat could be. Before the H model, the way you controlled the temperature in your house was uh, there'd be a switch where you literally turned on the, th the, the furnace uh, until someone was uncomfortable and then they would go up and turn it off and, and, and then you would turn it on again and stand your ground. And <laughs> it, this was the process. The H model allowed you to agree on a temperature and just pick it and stay there. And this unit was designed by the amazing designer Henry Dreyfus and his team. And they came in and they did all the things in 1953 that we think of as good design practice. They studied users, they created prototypes, they tested those prototypes, 
they rolled things out incrementally. It was really remarkable. And because of that, Honeywell owned the thermostat market for decades until 2011, when the Nest came out. A similarly round design with a completely different approach to how a thermostat works. Now, uh, you may not know this, but in uh, the District of Columbia and 33 states, it's now law that if you give a design talk, you have to mention the nest. Uh, there's still pending legislation in another 10 states. Wyoming doesn't care. But none of us care about Wyoming, so it's even. Uh, um, the, the, the thing is, is that I'm not going to talk about how awesome the nest is designed. In fact, I, I'm not that much of a believer in the nest. To my perspective, it's basically the eye of Sauron in your house. But uh, um, uh, what I'm most interested in is actually a different question that nobody ever asks, but is really important, which is why didn't Honeywell invent the nest? Honeywell owned the market. They were the market leader. Why did they not invest the nest? This is a really important question to answer because most of us work in companies that are like Honeywell. And how do we prevent the next nest from coming along? Well, to understand that, there's one more uh, maturity model we have to get our head around. And that's how markets mature. When something first comes into the market, we enter a phase called the technology phase. And at this phase, we are basically focused on just making the technology work. What does it take to just get the technology to work? Uh, this is the Motorola uh, SeaTac. It was a $4,000, four pound cell phone that barely worked. You had to buy two of them because you, you, whoever you were gonna talk to needed one too. And, uh, but, it, but it worked and it took off and people loved it. And they owned the market for a long time. But then there was an inflection point and the inflection point happens when a competitor emerges. And suddenly there were competitors from Nokia and Ericsson and other folks and they were producing these phones. And the stage that you get into then is all about features. What features do these phones have versus what features do those phones have? And those of you who are, who are old enough to remember phones from those days was it was all about what features. And you're like, I just want a phone to make a phone call. It's like, yeah, you can't just buy that anymore. You have to have all the features. Nokia came out with the N95 the, uh, uh, in the... Uh, uh, end of, of, 20, of 2006, and the, um, uh, the N95 could do fast frame video, it had all this uh, incredible music capability, you could send videos through SMS, it was all of this crazy stuff. But it never took off. Six months later, Apple introduced a phone where it wasn't about the features. It was about the experience. And that's what happened when the iPhone came out, was that suddenly we got to this point where there are no m more features anybody cares about. What they want is just something that will do the work that they would like to have this thing do. Now, for a long time, we thought this was the end of this progression. But it turns out there's one more stage. And that's when the product becomes part of something much bigger. Right now, nobody buys an iPhone because they want to make calls. In fact, we've breeded a whole generation of people who refuse to use the phone for a phone. <laughs> okay. And will do anything they can to go some other direction than actually talk on the phone. And so it's no longer about a phone. It's about being part of a bigger ecosystem, about being part of a bigger thing. And the phone part of it just becomes a commodity. And this is most obvious in really niche places. 
like uh, Wi-Fi on an airplane. A few years ago, American Airlines sued the company GoGo, who made their in-flight Wi-Fi system. They sued them to try and break the contract that they had. They had a 10-year contract. They were five years into it, and they wanted to break it because GoGo had let their technology lag, and the connectivity on American planes was so bad that customers were actually switching to other airlines like United because the Wi-Fi was better. Imagine losing customers to United. <laughs> That's how bad things had gotten. And so suddenly, uh, 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 American felt threatened by this. And they're like, you know what? We want to break the contract so we can get a new vendor in here and we can get better technology. The judge ended up throwing the case out. They ended up settling out of court. Uh, the judge said his reason for throwing it out was, who is stupid enough to sign a 10-year contract for Wi-Fi? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so they ended up settling. GoGo ended up coming up with better technology. Everybody's happy now. Uh, but the thing is, is that that little piece of technology is part of a bigger thing. And it was affecting the bigger thing even though it was seen as just a commodity inside that thing. We as passengers don't care what Wi-Fi system is being used. We care how effective the entire experience is. That's the commodity stage. So the thing about these stages is that you can't really start to work on the experience and commodity stage until you are at infused UX design. So we have to mature, or someone else will get there before us. But I haven't yet quite answered the important question, which was, why didn't Honeywell invent the nest? And using these models, we can sort of see what happened there. First, the H model was definitely a technology play. There was nothing out there before that. It was the thing people wanted, and they had no choice. Honeywell then dabbled with programmables for a while, but the user interfaces on those were so complicated and so hard to use that people never really adopted them. And the Nest succeeded because it is actually a minimal user interface. You turn it on, it uses machine learning to learn your behavior, it picks the temperature you want, it just tells who's fighting whom and then determines who's in the house. And so that's how it works. But the real answer comes when we look at uh, the organizational maturity because spot UX design was uh, what the first H model was. It was a one-time project at Honeywell. Henry Dreyfus came in, he did his design magic, people loved it, and then when they were done, when they shipped the product, he and his team packed up their stuff and they left. And Henry Dreyfus did what all great designers eventually do. He died. <laughs> no, really. Trust me, if you're a great designer, you will die too. It's just a matter of time, I promise. So Honeywell was left without any understanding of what good design was as soon as he packed up and retired and then passed away. Whereas uh, the, Nest, the Nest started at infused UX design. They got there first. That was their first stop. And I've had people tell me, well, maybe Honeywell didn't care. Honeywell's a big company. They make lots of things. The, the, the thermostat market was a really small part of their overall income. They make all sorts of industrial control systems. This was not a big market for them. Like, OK, that's fine. How not a big market is it? Well, Google paid $3.2 billion for the Nest. That's a pretty not big market to, to want to ignore. And I'm betting that Honeywell's folks would have been much happier to have part of that. But here's the thing that really is intriguing. What was it about Nest that made them UX infused? And our first thinking was that 
This is something we see in startup teams these days. We see startups that start way over here. And we, when we first started thinking about this, thought that every organization was like Disney or Honeywell, that they had to go through all the stages. But startups have this magical quality. They somehow uh, pull it off without going through all the stages. How is that? Well, our first theory, um, uh, we call the stem cell theory, which was that this idea that, that stem cells are uh, basically these, these different cells that form in the human body that are, uh, are in all mammals and, and most life, uh, uh, that when the embryo first forms, their purpose is just to reproduce. They just make more cells. And they double and they double and they double and that's what they keep doing. But they don't die off like other cells do when they're done with their function. They turn into something else. Some stem cells become liver cells, some stem cells become colon cells, some stem cell cells become stomach cells. And uh, we thought, well, maybe that's what happens. When you have small startup teams, they're like in an embryonic stage, and they can, they can pick whatever stage they want to start at. And then over time, they just sort of end up there. But it turns out that that theory, while enticing, was not the answer. There was a better answer. And the answer was this. When Honeywell first started, uh, or was at, when the Nest first came out, Honeywell was at this point where they had people all over the spectrum. They had not made any real investment in UX. They didn't, many of their people didn't understand who the users were or what they needed. They pretty much owned the market, so they didn't think they had to do anything different. And as a result, they had these people who are all over the spectrum. Nest, on the other hand, when they started, they were started by a guy named Tony Fidel. Tony Fidel was the lead designer behind the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. And Tony Fidel did what many startup founders do. He went to Apple and he raided the rest of his team that worked with him there. And they all went over to, to Nest. So his starting team were all people who were extremely design mature. Not because they had some magical qualities, but because they had already gone through this practice at other companies. And then, as they grew the company, the only way you could get a job there because everybody who was interviewing was a designer. The only way you could get a job there was to know something about design. If you didn't know something about design, you couldn't get a job. Even if you were applying for accounting, you could not get a job if you didn't understand design because they didn't want to deal with accounting people who didn't understand design. So everybody who came there understood design. So they started as a design-infused company by just hiring people who already knew that. Honeywell did not have that choice. The only thing Honeywell could do, potentially, is fire everybody and rehire people who understand design. Or train them up. But as a startup, they didn't have to do that. They, they, they had an advantage. Now, there's one more thing about this that I want to explain. And that thing is that uh, there's another inflection point. Turns out that even when you're infused UX design, you're still battling this momentum in the organization where there's this perception that if something works technically, if it meets the business needs, we can ship it. It doesn't matter if the design is not a great design. It only matters that it works because we can fix it in the next release. Right? That becomes the mantra. Well, we'll fix it in the next release. For the longest time, I thought that was Microsoft's tagline. <laughs> We're going to fix it in the next release. <laughs> and turns out there's an inflection point that happens. And that's when everyone understands the importance of design to the point where suddenly it has to work technically, it has to meet the business needs, and it has to be delightful. Disney's Magic Band was two years late. It was supposed to come out in 2012. 
It took him seven years to produce that project. And for two years, senior management was, and by senior management, I mean like Eisner, Michael Eisner and Bob Iger and Roy Disney were talking to the team every day, asking if they were ready. Are we going to ship it? They were so paranoid that a competitor was going to beat them to it that they were focused on um, uh, getting to that moment right, of shipping. But two years, it wasn't ready. And because it was not going to deliver the right experience, I mean, you could use the band to open the hotel room doors. You could use it to pay for some of the things in the park. But it wasn't ready for the vision they'd set. And every day, the product management would say, we're not ready yet. The board members would back off and say, OK, we'll talk to you tomorrow. And that's what they did for two years. That thing, waiting for design to be the experience you're, you want, we call that the UX tipping point. When you get to that inflection point, that is, as far as we know, the end game. That's what we're shooting for. So now, how do we get there? We like to talk about process, design process. And the way we tend to talk about design process is this automated mechanical thing. We pull the ball back, we let it go, and the process takes care of itself. And we are so fixated on process that it's hard to go to any collection of designers or IAs or whoever and not get in a conversation of what's your process? What's your process, right? When we interview new candidates, that's one of the most important questions we ask them. What's your process? What should I put in my portfolio? We want to see your process. We fetish on process. I don't know why we ask new candidates what their process is. It's not like we're going to let them use it. <laughs> Hell, we are highly unlikely to let them use our process because we don't get to use our process. Because process, it doesn't work. Process is what we use to get something done, but it won't be what we use to get the next thing done. We have to change it up. That's because we have to adapt to situations. We have to have situational awareness. And this idea of situational awareness is we have to think about it, right? So this is a, this is a sports ball field, right? <laughs> and when, uh, uh, when the players come running onto the football pitch or the basketball diamond or whatever it is, Right? They don't come out with this giant Gantt chart <laughs> that has swim lanes for every player. And the coach doesn't say, Harold, at 4 minutes and 22 seconds, I'd really like you, please, to score. Because that's where you scored last game, and it worked really well. Can you just make sure you score at that moment? Right? That's not how this project is going to work. Right? Instead, we come in and we assess the field and we figure out what the situation is. We look at their strengths and weaknesses. We look at our strengths and weaknesses. We figure out who's on which injured list. We figure out what the conditions of the field are. We look at all these things and we have to be completely adaptable to these types of elements. So it's a more systemic approach. And design is a systemic activity. It is not a process. We are not factories producing exactly the same thing every time. We are producing something different every time, so we have to think about the system dynamics. And as a result, we can't think about it from a process standpoint. We have to think about it in terms of the way the sports ball teams think about it, and they think in terms of having a set of plays. In sports ball, a playbook is made up of plays which are completely set based on that particular set of situations. These are the plays that we are going to adapt to. And we don't know what order we're going to do them in. And we don't know whether we will do all of them or some of them or we'll repeat some of them three times or we'll never do it at all. We pick and choose. 
based on the situation. And so we come up with a set of plays. And we went out and said, OK, well, what are all the different ways that teams have been successful? And we, decide, we found 130 different strategic plays that teams used. And we started to sort them. And we realized some of the plays are great for teams that are still struggling with literacy. Some of the plays are great with teams struggling with fluency. Some of the plays are sticking with mastery. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to give you a link to the slides. <laughs> but I'm OK if you want to take a picture, in fact. <laughs> and these are just some of the plays. There's 130. This is just a small subset of the plays that are here. Uh, but um, there's still 111 to go. But the, uh, there's three that I sort of want to point out in the last few minutes that we have for this. And those three are, uh, uh, we'll start with what we call uh, immersive exposure. Immersive exposure is what happens, it's a literacy play, it's what happens when we get folks out into the world to actually see what it's like to be users. And this is like the starting point. If you did nothing else but focused on exposure in your organization, you would see a tremendous improvement in the quality of the products that you ship because the people working on them would now know that users exist and now know how awful the experience is. We often in our field talk about how we have to teach people empathy. We don't have to teach anybody empathy. You cannot learn empathy. You either have empathy or you don't. Most people have it. The remaining people are technically called sociopaths. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so you either have empathy or don't. What we don't do is give them access to use their empathy because we keep them insulated from the people they're supposed to empathize with. So they are just completely unaware. If we can get them exposed to those people, we can do that. Most organizations start with regular usability testing. And by the way, it's usability testing, not user tests. I'm on a mission to get people to stop using the phrase user test. We are not testing the users. We are testing the design. It's a usability test. But the, uh, uh, that's a place to start, but that will limit you if that's where you stop. You really need to start to get out into the field, meet people in their own environments, see what's going on. And this is everybody, every influencer on the team has to get into the field. Because it turns out that when we started to count the number of hours people were exposed, we saw this hockey stick that happened in the quality of the product at a minimum of two hours every six weeks. So if we can get teams to spend, each member of the team to spend a minimum of two hours every six weeks, that's only, uh, uh, you know, out of 240 hours, that, that's, that's a very small percentage. It's 1% it's of the time that we're talking about. If we can spend 1% of our time actually with users, watching them use the designs, we will see a dramatic improvement. And you can do simple things like create you know, what we call a, a, a simple journey map where we take the milestones that someone has to do to use whatever it is we're delivering and we map it on a scale of extreme frustration to extreme delight and suddenly we say, okay, this part was delightful, this part was frustrating, these parts were f delightful, these parts were frustrating, and we map all this out. Now. Once we've done this, we now have a picture as to where we need to focus. And that exposure got us there. And we can now talk on a common language. So that's the first play. If you can just do that, you will be seeing improvements pretty quickly. The second one is to then form what we call a shared experience vision. And an experience vision is uh, a picture of what the design will be like at some point in the future, say five years from now. And this is both a literacy and a, ma a fluency play because now we are talking about not just the difference between good and bad, but how we're going to get there. And when we think about the vision, the vision is basically a flag in the sand that everybody on the team can see. 
but it's like five years going away. We have to, we, we're gonna take baby steps between now and then, and it's gonna take us five years to get there. But because we all can see it, we can converge on that point, no matter where we start at. And so we have to make sure everybody understands what the vision is. How do you figure out what the vision should be? Well, it turns out that's actually not that difficult once you understand what your current experience is. Because you just asked the question, what would happen if we made it delightful all the way across? So that becomes our shared experience vision. The third uh, play is what we call a culture of continuous learning. This is useful both for literacy, fluency, and mastery. Because what we want to do is set up this place where we are constantly learning more about who our users are, what they need, what our tools are, what our capabilities are, what new things we could tackle. We want to be always be learning. Now, in our field, in the tech field in general, we're always hearing about this idea that we have to be open to risk, which means we have to be open to failure. And to do that, we have to be happy with failure. We have to enjoy failure. We have to encourage failure. We, we cannot be fail uh, uh, resistant. Uh, but here's the thing. Nobody seems, even though we all say this, nobody likes it when the CEO calls us into the office and says, so why did we fail? <coughs> well, sir, the reason we failed was because uh, that's the only way we can learn. So we wanted to fail because we wanted you to learn something. We chose to fail really big so you would notice. <laughs> yeah, this answer does not make anybody happy. What we'd rather be called into the CEO's office and be asked is, what do we learn? Right? And if we, if we create a culture of continuous learning, we can do that. Now, uh, Natalie mentioned Center Center. Center Center is our school for UX designers in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And it's a two-year program. And throughout that program, uh, the students are always working on real world projects that are supplied by companies and sometimes those projects don't go well. But every day we have a stand up because we're trying to teach them what it's like to be an employee so we do employee rituals and so one of the things we do is a stand up. And the stand up has the standard questions that you ask in stand ups. What you do, do since the last stand up, what are you planning to do before the next stand up, what's your highest priority, what's standing in your way. But we added a fifth question. And the fifth question is, what's the most important thing that you learned and how will it change what you do in the future? And every day, the student has to reflect, and not just the student, the staff member, the faculty members, everybody has to reflect and think about what is the most important thing they learned. And that's really fascinating. When you have everybody thinking about what they learned, when you have the CEO coming to the meeting and saying what they learned that they didn't know, it changes this perception that CEOs and executives always know everything and we just have to wait for them to tell us what they want, to, hey, they're learning just like we're learning. And the most important thing are the things we need to learn. So those are the three plays. If you just do these, you know, there's 127 more that we found, but if you just did these three plays, you would see marked improvement in what your organization's producing. And if you did that, you would be in a situation where one day you could have the experience that many of the people at Disney had, where they got to watch a six-year-old walk up and put their magic band up next to what's called the Magic Mickey, who then authenticated them and let them into the park and makes this little boop noise that is specially tuned such that all of the Disney employees who are standing in a 15 foot radius of that entry point, turn around, look at the kid and say, happy birthday, Angela. Okay, it's a little creepy, <laughs> but it's cool. <laughs> That's what great design can do. So, just to summarize here, people learn from, uh, uh, by growing from unconscious incompetence, at least up to conscious competence, and we have to help folks get there. Uh, 
we need to grow our efforts by taking folks from UX design as a service all the way to embedded UX design and eventually to infused UX design. And to do that, we're going to need some sort of playbook. We're going to have to adapt situationally, and we're going to have to find what it takes to become design driven. Uh, if this fascinated you at all, uh, we do a workshop. We have, the next one's in April. It's got four seats left. There's another one in June after that. We basically go through all 130 plays. You create your own playbook for your team. So teams often bring their development and product peers with them, and they create a playbook together, and that becomes their action plan for the next six to eight months. Um, We've also created a new newsletter called uh, UX Strategy with Jared Spool. That, that's me. Um, and uh, every week we take something about those plays and we put it into the newsletter telling stories of what we're seeing in our research. And uh, we've created this new uh, landing page for this talk. It's at uie.com slash tipping. And if you uh, go there, you'll get a copy of this presentation. Uh, you'll get uh, the transcript and the slides in case you want that. There are articles on many of the things I talked about if you want to learn more about that. And you can sign up for the newsletter there. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, all the information that we've produced exists on the UIE site. Uh, you can start there. If uh, we're not connected on LinkedIn, please reach out and connect to me. Uh, there, or you can reach out to me with this email address. And finally, you can follow me at, at JM Spool on the Twitters, where I tweet about design, design strategy, design education, and the amazing customer service habits of the airline industry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. Thank you.